Hello and welcome to another 3ABN Today Bible Q&A program. I love this program. Just last night, I was talking with one of our viewers, a dear sister from the state of Arkansas. She is a Baptist and she loves 3ABN Today Bible Q&A. And she said, mm. I learned so much and now I am celebrating on the seventh day Sabbath. Praise so you know who Lord. you are. Thank you for being part of our 3ABN family. And that's why we do what we do. That's why we do Bible Q&A. Will you send in your questions and the questions are answered by our dedicated team of family members here. And I'm looking forward to the answers that they will have for your questions. But you might be saying, boy, I want to send in questions right now or maybe during the program. You can do that one of three ways. You can text us 618-228. 3975. That number again is 618-228-3975. You can text your Bible questions in. We will answer them on a future program. Or you can email us, BibleQA at 3ABN.TV. That address again is BibleQA at 3ABN.TV. Or you can go to Instagram, and our Instagram account is 3ABN underscore official, and you can send us your Bible questions that way. Speaking of our panel, I got to introduce the family to you. Mm -hmm. To my right is Pastor Ryan Day. Glad you're here, brother. Amen. Always a blessing to be a part of this special program. Amen. Next to you, my sister, Shelly Quinn, and delighted you're here. Oh, I love getting into the Word of God, and we just want to thank you for sending your questions because it's really, it's fun for for us too. Amen. Absolutely. Amen. Last but not least, on the other end of the island here, mm -hmm. Pastor James Rafferty, delighted you're here as well. Good to be here, Jill, and looking forward to our session today. we got some great questions. Amen. Before we open up the Word of God, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. Pastor James, would you pray for us? Sure. Father, I want to thank you again for your Word. It's such a blessing. It's such a privilege to delve in and to guide and direct our viewers to answers that you give us yes. through uh, your Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. We want to ask that you'll be with each of the viewers, that you will speak to their hearts, then the answers will minister to them. Yes. And we just thank you for the privilege of being part of this uh, great ministry, mm -hmm. taking the gospel to all the world. Um, bless, guide, direct, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to start. There's great questions. I've already had a sneak peek at these cards put together, and we have great questions that have already come in. Pastor James, we're going to start with you. This question is kind of heavy. Okay. This comes from Dominic in Pennsylvania. All right. Is it okay to commit suicide? Mm. All right. Great question, Dominic in Pennsylvania. Um, the answer to that question, the simple answer to that question is no. Uh, the Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 13, thou shalt not kill. Uh, and the Hebrew there is murder. You know, so God basically is telling us that we not only should not kill or murder others, but this would also apply to how we treat ourselves. We're to love others as we love ourselves. And so it's very important for us to recognize that God has sovereignty over our bodies. And we're not our own. We've been bought with a price, uh, the Bible tells us. Um, this doesn't mean, though, that God can't forgive uh, suicide, mm -hmm. uh, just like he can forgive every other sin. In fact, when you look at the experience of Samson in the Old Testament, he appears to have committed suicide. You know, he was uh, called of God to be a judge in Israel. He messed up several times in his life, and he got to the place where he was actually blinded, literally, by the enemies and taken captive and made fun of. Um, mm -hmm. He was uh, made sport of, and finally he got to the place where he was in the temple of the Philistines, and he prayed to God that God would give him strength. His strength was in his hair, which had been shorn or cut um, by uh, deceptive workings of Delilah. And so he prayed for strength, and he was brought to the center of the temple where the pillars were, and as he asked God for strength to bring this temple down, he asked, could I perish? Please let me perish with the Philistines. Now, we know that Samson, even though he uh, requested to die, that Samson is going to be saved. Uh, mm. He is mentioned specifically, he is mentioned yeah. in Hebrews chapter 11, in the faith chapter, the hall of faith chapter. And so we know that God can forgive us of all of our sins. Um, but 
At the same time, we need to recognize that it is not okay to commit suicide. It is a sin to commit suicide. God can forgive that sin definitely, but we are tampering with the devil when we take into our hands the life that belongs solely to God, and that includes our own life. Mm. Thank you so much, Pastor James. I like that. It's the truth of the word, but there's hope in that as well. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the word, Pastor Ryan, we're coming to you. Right. This is a question having to do with Sabbath mm -hmm. observance. I only get two Saturdays off a month and two Sundays off a month. My job is feeding a whole jail, food in the kitchen. Is it wrong to go to a Bible truth church I also like, keeping my fellowship alive? And this comes from Mackenzie. Okay, absolutely. Well, thank you for submitting that question, Mackenzie. I'm going to handle this question in two different aspects because I see within your question there are two areas that I think the Bible gives us clear counsel upon. The first thing, uh, I, you know, I have to counsel you, my sister, that I, as I'm sure you are aware, uh, you know, because you mentioned here that you get two Saturdays off and also two Sundays off a month. But I think the first thing that we have to recognize is what does the Bible teach in regards to Sabbath keeping? Mm -hmm. He doesn't want us to just do it half time. He wants us to be full time, right, and serve him. And so I just want to reference here for you Exodus chapter 20 verses 8 through 11, which is the commandment itself. It says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. Mm. Uh, and then it goes on to say, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your uh, female servant, uh, nor your cattle or stranger with us, that is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So, you know, I would just counsel you, my sister, that, you know, pray out to God and say, Lord, I'm in an, an interesting situation. I have a job that's only allowing me off two Sabbaths. Maybe there needs to be some conversation with your boss to allow you to bring your life in harmony with with God's word in regards to Sabbath keeping because the Lord wants you to, to, to receive the full blessing of the rest that, that He wants to give you on every single Sabbath, not just two Sabbaths out of the month. But the second part of your question uh, in regards to a faith uh, a, tr a Bible truth church is what you had said here. Um, you know, in, in regards to, you know, I guess the other two Sundays off, is it okay to perhaps maybe go to another church that attends on Sunday rather than Sabbath? In this case, I would say, for the record, we know that there's good people in all churches and all denominations. Okay. So we're not going to throw anybody under the bus. God loves His people, and I believe He's leading people in all denominations and non-denominations. But nonetheless, we also have to make sure that we fit uh, the, we fit our lives within the harmony of what the Bible teaches in regards to the faith and the, and the faith of His church. And, uh, you know, Jesus prayed right there in John chapter 17, verse 17. He said, you know, speaking uh, uh, to the Father about his, the leadership of His church, He said, Father, sanctify them by Your truth. Your Word is truth. So, you know, I would always say that if, if it's a faith-based church and they are living according to the Word of God and they teach according to the Word of God, then they should also be a Bible Sabbath keeper church. Mm. So if it's a Sunday keeping church, we have to be careful uh, because remember in Revelation 12, 17, when the devil is wroth with the woman, the last day remnant church, what was the description of her who keeps the commandments of God and has the testimony of Jesus? And, you know, just, I'm going to throw this one out there just for reference as well. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So we definitely want to encourage you to keep your fellowship alive, but I would encourage you to, to first ask the Lord to bring your life life in harmony with the Bible Sabbath and find a Sabbath keeping church, preferably a Seventh-day Adventist church that will also encourage you and help you along this journey as well. Amen. Amen. I love that answer. Thank you very much, Ryan. Shelly, we're coming to you. I like this question. I think a lot of people have asked it. Was evil created by God? And this mm. comes from Ollie in Florida. Well, Ollie, uh, sometimes God causes misfortune to try to get his people to repent. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes he just lets us pay the consequences of sin. But in Isaiah 45 and verse 7, where God says, I create evil, he's talking about misfortune to get his people to repent. But God is not the author mm -hmm. of moral evil or pain. He is love. He cannot sin. Everything that he created was perfect and he created a perfect angel named Lucifer. He gave Lucifer the sacred gift of free will mm. and Lucifer actually was a covering cherub at the throne of God, mm. but he abused his free will. 
because he suffered from self-corruption. Let's look at Ezekiel 28, 14 through 17. Ezekiel 28, verse 14. You were the anointed cherub who covers. That's Lucifer. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in all of your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. So Lucifer's heart was lifted up in pride and a desire for control and worship. Yes. We see in Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 14, listen to this. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, weakened to the nations. You've said in your heart, I will ascend into mm -hmm. heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights. I will be like the most high. So mm -hmm. Lucifer, it is his self-corruption that created evil. Jesus said in John 8, 44, speaking to the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. He is a liar mm. and the mm -hmm. father of it. Now, when God created Adam and Eve, he gave them that sacred gift of free will. He set them in yes. the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Pleasure. Mm. Everything was perfect. Only one prohibition out of all the beautiful fruit trees. He said, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Mm. And mm. they declared their independence from God when they disobeyed. Mm. And you know what? It is the abuse of free will that causes evil. Mm. When we follow in mm. Satan's footsteps, mm -hmm. Paul says in Romans 1, he says, professing to be wise, they became fools. Mm -hmm. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie for this reason. And Paul further states that God gave them up mm -hmm. to the lust of their heart. Mm -hmm. He honored their right to choose. He will never violate free will. Mm -hmm. mm, that's very good, Shelley. Mm -hmm. I like that. Mm -hmm. It's a philosophical question. It's a deep question. And some right. people question God because of that. So mm -hmm. very good. I love that. The abuse of free will causes evil. I, mm -hmm. I wrote that down. Very good. Mm -hmm. Pastor Ryan, we're coming back to you. And this has right. to do with presumption. And what is presumption? Okay. How do I live in the belief of Matthew 7, 7, but not be said to be presumptuous? And this comes from Pris from Kenya. Amen. Absolutely. I think the the best way to, to approach this is first kind of establish the difference between presumption and faith. I think that's that's good way good place to good place to start. The biggest difference between faith and presumption, and I made some notes on this to make sure I didn't mess up because I when I was studying this through and I came to this conclusion, I thought this is great. In fact, I'm probably going to build a sermon on this. Yay. Uh, it, it, the biggest difference between faith and presumption is about result. Presumption assumes a certain result, a specific end game, and but faith, of course, is much bigger than that. Faith is deeper than that because faith. Uh, basically it means that uh, we are not outcome driven but rather we are God driven mm -hmm. that that is of course our faith is in God himself right it's, it's mm -hmm. God focused uh, his wisdom his providence his love his justice it's in him as opposed to a certain outcome uh, so to that end there's a specific phrase in the Bible that points out uh, points us to the difference and of course I found this to be in Daniel chapter 3 of all places mm -hmm. so we go to Daniel chapter 3 and uh, and read verses 16 to 18 three words that really specify or differentiate between that of presumption and faith. And it's the three words, but if not, mm. but if good. not, here it is. Mm. Daniel chapter three, verses 16 through 18. It says, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O king Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. That It says, if that in the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. Verse 18, 
But if not, mm. yeah. let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor uh, will we worship the god, uh, excuse me, the gold image which you have set up. Mm. And so in this case, uh, you could see the difference between faith and presumption. They're not presumptuously saying, no, God's going to show up and he's going to do this. They said, look, if God does this, praise the Lord. He can and he, he mm. could if he wanted to. But if not, mm. then, you know, so be it also. We're still mm. going to serve him. In other words, faith is not measured by results. It's measured by confidence in the God behind the results. And so I also want to just add here also that when we're, when we're reading Matthew chapter 7 there, of course, where it talks about, you know, you know uh, knock and it shall be open to you, seek and you shall find, yeah. ask and, and it shall be given you. Uh, you know, obviously we know the original Greek there talks about continually doing this, continually right. ask, continually knock, continually seeking the Lord. But we also have to do it within the context of God's will. And that's where 1 John chapter 5 verses 14 and 15 comes in. It says, now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask, Ask, okay, that's what we're doing in Matthew 7, right? If we ask anything, here it is, mm -hmm. here's the key, according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. So put your faith in the Lord. Uh, and and when, you, when you're seeking the Lord, if you're seeking those things and asking those things in accordance uh, for the will of God for your life, then you know that maybe in His perfect timing, maybe not your timing, but in His perfect timing, He will answer. Uh, so yeah, do not put your faith in the results, but rather the God of the results. Ooh, that's yeah. good. I love that. Faith and presumption. We're going to view Pastor James next. Okay. And this one comes from Mary Lou in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Where does it say in the Bible that Jesus did die the second death literally? Because I believe that there is no resurrection in the second death, according to scripture. And if Jesus died the second death, when did he die the first death? Please show me the scripture verses that confirm that Jesus died the second death. All right, that's a great question, uh, Mary Lou. And it's one that takes me back to the 1980s. I remember dealing with this question with friends. We were studying it and trying to get to the bottom of it. And so the Bible doesn't actually say that Jesus died the second death. So there's no text that I can point you to that say Jesus died the second death. The phrase is only used four times in all the Bible. And all four of those times are in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. Now, two verses that use the second death describe those who will not be hurt by the second death or over which the second death will not have no power. And then there are two verses that describe the experience of the second death. And they describe the experience of the second death as an experience of judgment, the judgment of God against sin. So the first two verses are Revelation 2 verse 11 and Revelation 20 verse 6. And then the other two verses, those are the, those are the positive references, uh, promising believers they will not be hurt by the second death or not, the second death will not have power over them. The other two verses are found in Revelation 20 verse 14 and Revelation 20 verse 8. Now those final two verses, um, they tell us in the contents the context that the second death is a judgment against sin mm. and against those who've refused to let go of sin. Mm. So it's important to recognize that none of these verses actually describe the second death as a permanent death. Um, now that doesn't mean that the second death is not a permanent death. It is a permanent death. That's obvious. The fact is, is obvious in the context. But the point of these last two verses is that the second death is an experience of judgment against sin. The fact that the second death is permanent is obvious, but the nature of the second death is what is significant in the teaching of the book of Revelation. So the question we really need to ask is, did Jesus experience the judgment of the second death That's described good. in Revelation chapter 20 mm -hmm. verses 14 and and verse uh, chapter 21, verse eight. So in other words, was Jesus judged according to our works, right? Was Jesus judged as an unbeliever and a liar and a murderer? That's what the second death, those who experienced the second death experience. So first of all, we're told in Hebrews chapter two and verse ten, nine that Jesus tasted death, yeah. right? For every man, for every person. And of course this would describe or it would help us to understand why believers will not be heard of the second death, <laughs> according to Revelation 2.11, because Jesus tasted death for us who believe in him. So we, the second death will have no power over us. So that death obviously is the death that we deserve as the wages of sin or the second death. Now, number two, uh, we note that the book of Revelation really does describe the second death 
in a phrase that is unique in all the Bible. However, the book of Revelation borrows from the rest of the Bible. In other words, the second death terminology may not be used in other places of the Bible, but the idea of the second mm -hmm. death is. It's described in the rest of the Bible with the terminology of cut off, Mm -hmm. cursed and forsaken of God. And we find this in verses uh, like Matthew 24, verse 51, Psalm 88, verses 5 and 16, two times it's prophesying that Christ will be cut off. And then we find Daniel 9, 26, also affirming mm -hmm. the same experience that Christ had. Number three, forsaken, this other biblical term referring to the second death experience, is describing Christ in Psalm 21, verse 1, and again confirmed in Matthew 27, verse 46. And of course, that's why we're not forsaken according to 2 Corinthians 4, verse 9. And then curse, the final one, is yet another biblical phrase denoting the second death experience, Matthew 25, verse 41, and Romans 9, verse 3. Christ, the Bible says, was made a curse for us, yes. Galatians 3.13. Right. This is because Christ became sin for us, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, and the wages of sin is death. So Christ experienced the curse, the forsakenness. He experienced everything that the second death entails in the book of Revelation. Amen. Ooh. That was one of the clearest explanations I've heard yes, on the second death. Sure. It's very good. And you got a list in there. Speaking of, <laughs> that's right. That's a Sabbath school panel joke. Okay, so speaking of Jesus and death, we're going to Shelley. This has to do with Gethsemane. Okay. This is from Trina in Alto Loma, California. The night before Jesus was taken, he told the disciples he needed to go pray. He went and asked um, in the garden. He said, Father in heaven, if that is possible, take this cup from me. If Jesus already knew why he came to earth, what he was going to go through, and why he was to die on a cross, why would Jesus ask God to take the cup from him? Oh, I love that question. And uh, Trina. It, we definitely know that Jesus knew because it was planned before the foundation of the world. So he knew, as uh, Philippians 2, 5 through 8 says, that God came down, took on the flesh of man, and he became obedient even to the point of death on the cross. Mm -hmm. But in John 12, 27, Jesus knew he was going to die as he was going to experience the wrath of God die the substitutionary death for the penalty of our sin. And in John 12, 27, he expressed his anxiety before the Last Supper. Let's read this. Mm. This is before the Garden of Gethsemane. So John 12, 27, he says, my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, mm -hmm. save me from this hour? Mm -hmm. No, but for this purpose, I came to this hour. Mm. So he knew his purpose, but the sinless Savior realized that he had to bear the weight of our sins, face the wrath of God, mm -hmm. and be separated from his Father. Second Corinthians 5.21 said he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might mm -hmm. become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So later when he was in the garden, the weight of the sin mm -hmm. was already causing him to be in agony. He was sweating drops of blood. He was already feeling alienated from the Father, separated. Mm -hmm. And just think if you were totally mm -hmm. sinless and pure to mm -hmm. take this on. So what happens is he expresses his true mm -hmm. human feelings. To me, this mm -hmm. shows the humanity yeah. Yeah. of Jesus about the suffering death. He says in Mark 14, 36, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup from me. And then he says, nevertheless, mm. not what I will, mm. but what you will. So he's dreading the shame. He's dreading the separation, the suffering. Mm -hmm. But he says, not my will. Yeah. but yours. And I love Hebrews 12 too. I know that's one of your favorite <laughs> scriptures. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, mm -hmm. who for the joy mm -hmm. that was set before him endured mm -hmm. the cross, despising the shame, mm -hmm. and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of the Father. Mm -hmm. The joy of accomplishing God's will, the plan of redemption, the joy of rejoining his Father on the throne, mm -hmm. and the joy of having the glory he had with the Father before the world 
restored to him. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you so much for that, Shelley. Pastor James, we're coming right back to you okay. because this is staying with the crucifixion in that time. Okay. This comes from a viewer in Jamaica. Please explain Jesus' three nights in the grave. All right. So this is uh, another good question in relationship to Christ. Um, a lot of people struggle with that because they don't do what we call inclusive reckoning. They want it a full 24 hours. So when he says three days and three nights, we're looking at 72 hours altogether. But the Bible doesn't speak about days that way all the time. And so, and the, the other point that I think is really significant here is that Jesus Christ, it begins this time in the, the, as it were, Jonah, belly of the whale, so to speak, in the, the power of darkness on Thursday evening. And we don't always equate that evening into the three days and the three mm -hmm. nights in our partial reckoning. So the first verse we want to look at is Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And I love this because it's telling us, it's making a parallel between Christ and Jonah. Jonah was actually alive. Now we know Christ eventually died, but part of his, part of those three days and three nights was while he was alive. While Christ was alive, we know the agony began, as you were talking about, in Gethsemane. Mm. That's where he first felt that withdrawal of Christ, I mean of God, from him. And he mm. felt as though he was being separated. He was going through that agony. So um, Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites, Christ says in Luke 11, verse 30, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. So Jonah is a type of Christ in this sense. Jonah was alive, you know, that whole time Christ was alive part of the time of his agony. Then we look at Luke chapter 22, verse 53. Jesus says, when I was daily with you in the temple, the mob have come to, to, to gather him now to take him to trial and to crucify him. You stretch forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. So that verse proves that the time that Christ was under the power of darkness, the prince of this world began on Thursday evening. So you used to have Thursday evening, then you have Friday, and then you have Friday evening, and then you have Sabbath. He's in the tomb, and then you have Sunday morning. So those are the three days and the three nights, Thursday night, Friday night, Sabbath night, and you've got got Friday, Sabbath, and Sunday, partial reckoning again. And then finally, you want to look in Luke chapter 22, verses 41 to 44. Luke 22, 41 to 44. When he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, he kneeled down, he prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thy will. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Why? Why did the angel come to strengthen him? Luke is the only one that mentions this. The reason the angel comes to strengthen him is because Jesus Christ, bearing the weight of the sins of the world, would have died in Gethsemane. As Shelley, you shared earlier, he was sweating, as it were, yes. great drops of blood. The agony, blood, the agony was too great. The angel came to give him supernatural strength to endure the trial, which began that Thursday evening. And he, being in agony, prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. So these are the references that you can look at to look at the three days and the three nights. Again, it's partial days, inclusive reckoning. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. You know, such a blessing to hear the answers yes. you all study, but and you all know the Word of God. You might be saying, but I've had a question for many years, and I really want to know the answer. You can send your questions. We will answer them on an upcoming Bible Q&A program. You can text us 618-228-3975. That number again is 618-228-3975. You can email in your questions. That's BibleQA at 3ABN.TV. BibleQA at 3ABN.TV or you can go to Instagram. That's 3ABN underscore official and you can send us your Bible question and we would love to answer it on an upcoming program. Mm -hmm. Pastor Ryan, we're coming to you. All right. This is a viewer from South Dakota okay. and it has to do with the feast days. I believe we do not need to keep the feast anymore as Jesus is the reality and what he's done for us. That said, how would a person explain Exodus 12, 14 where it says celebrating the Passover is an everlasting ordinance? 
All right, this is a great question, and I'm going to need four minutes at least to answer it. So, <laughs> okay, so basically, I want to start just by simply making the point that in Scripture, everlasting or forever, we hear these terms often, everlasting, eternal, forever. Um, in many cases in Scripture, these are, these are descriptive words, or words that are used in terms or in, in connection with something that has already ended. Uh, for instance, here, I'm going to just reference a couple of things here. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed with, as the Bible says in Jude 1 and 7, with an eternal or everlasting fire. Of course, if that meant like we normally would think in the modern, you know, to infinity and beyond never ending perspective, then we would still be able to go over to where Sodom and Gomorrah once was and we'd still see them in flames today, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's not the case. That means that in Scripture, oftentimes when something is described as being everlasting, forever, uh, eternal, unquenchable, you know, unquenchable fire, like in, you know, hellfire, we know obviously those things are pertaining to, uh, uh, in, which pertaining to events that will come to an end, they will be brought to an end or have already ended. I also think of Jonah, you mentioning Jonah mm -hmm. uh, in your previous question, you know, Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, but yet if you go read in the book of Jonah, Jonah describes his experience there as being in, you know, in the belly of that fish forever. And we know that he wasn't in there forever, right? right. We would take, take that term forever and think, oh, it's, it goes on, it, it's, it's mm -hmm. perpetual, it's never ending. Mm -hmm. Same thing here, this was an everlasting ordinance for the Jews. And I have to highlight this. I know that uh, our viewer here that submitted this from South Dakota, I know that you specifically may obviously believe that Jesus is the fulfillment of these. But for our viewers that may be questioning this, I just want to highlight a few things here. Uh, how we know that this is for sure not an everlasting ordinance for everyone, but only for the Jews, is if you go right there in Exodus 12, if you go on down where, this, where the Passover is established in Exodus 12 and go to verses 43 and 45, notice what it says here. It says, this is the ordinance of the Passover, no foreigner shall eat it, mm. uh oh, no foreigner, but every man's servant who has bought for money, when you have circumcised him, then he may eat it. A sojourner and a hired servant shall not eat of it. So was everyone uh, capable according to the standard that was set? Uh, was everyone free to participate in the Passover? No, it was a Jewish thing. It was only for the Jewish people and only those individuals who were circum circumcised within their camps could eat of it only in certain circumstances. Even when you get over to the New Testament, it's interesting that the, the feasts are, are, are likened into Jewish feasts. For instance, John chapter 5, verse 1, it says, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. The very next chapter, John chapter 6, verse 4, Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. So notice this Passover is a feast of the Jews. It wasn't for everyone. John chapter 7, verse 2, next chapter over, it says, Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. This was a Jewish feast. This was a temporary thing. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, for those viewers who are questioning this, who might, who might have been taught that this is something we all should be doing and that it's still in place today, we know that Christ was the fulfillment of those Jewish feasts. That was a part of the old law that, of course, was nailed yeah. to the cross when Jesus mm -hmm. died. He was the fulfillment. They all point to Jesus Christ in His ministry. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7 says, Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be, uh, that, that you may be a new lump mm -hmm. since you truly are in leaven. For indeed Christ our Passover was mm -hmm. sacrificed for us. Jesus is the fulfillment of that ultimately. Even Galatians chapter 3 verse 19, speaking of that old law contained in ordinances that of course included the feast days, it says, what purpose does the law serve? It was added because of transgression till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was appointed through angels by the hand of the mediator. Jesus was that coming seed. He brought an end to it. So it's not everlasting for everyone. It was only to be everlasting until it had served its purpose purpose of which Jesus Christ fulfilled it at the cross of Calvary. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, Shelly, we're coming to you. This is from Pam in Missouri. What is pleading the blood of Jesus and where is it found in the Bible? Mm -hmm. Well, Pam, the term pleading the blood of Jesus is not mentioned in Scripture anywhere, although it is used in many Christian circles and often it's used to invoke God's blessing, but sometimes it's in a misdirected way mm. because it's like they're trying to coax God to fulfill their desires. Mm. I want to point this out. The phrase pleading the blood of Jesus has no extraordinary power, mm -hmm. but we do know the blood of Jesus does have extraordinary power. Matthew 26, 28, 
Yes. Jesus said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. In Hebrews 13, mm -hmm. 20, it talks about his blood being the blood of the ever lasting covenant mm -hmm. in Revelation 1, 5, one of my favorites. It's talking about from Jesus Christ to him who loved us, washed us from our sins in his own blood. And you know, I, I, will, I don't use the expression pleading the blood, but Psalm 51, one and two, mm. uh, David says, oh, have mercy on me according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse mm. me from my sin. Mm. So sometimes I pray and I say, oh Lord, wash me thoroughly in the blood of Jesus mm. and cleanse my sin. Mm -hmm. Revelation 12, 11 says, they overcame Satan mm -hmm. by the blood of the lamb mm -hmm. and the word of their testimony. And we know as you were referring to in Exodus in the Passover, the blood around the doorpost mm -hmm. was a sign mm -hmm. that when the angel of death saw the blood pass over the house mm -hmm. and the plague would not fall on them. But as you said, 1 Corinthians 15, 7, Christ is our Passover. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So here's the bottom line. Pleading the blood of Jesus is not a biblical phrase. It has no extraordinary power and we have to be careful about using it. Mm -hmm. But Hebrews 7.25 says this, therefore he, Jesus Christ, is able to save to the uttermost yes. those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. See, Jesus is pleading on our behalf. Mm -hmm. yeah. The merits of his blood, his life is in the blood and Jesus is interceding for us always. Amen. Amen. What Amen. hope that gives us, Amen. knowing Absolutely. that he is interceding for us always. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. This one, Pastor James, is a little heavy as well. We started okay. with a heavy one for you. This one is too. This is from Cindy in Alabama. Okay. It's a follow-up to uh, an answer you had given. On January 3, 2022, on the 3BN Today Bible Q&A, mm -hmm. you answered the question, why are the wicked dead raised just to be punished in the fire? Mm -hmm. What I want to know is why would God want us to see our family burning? Mm -hmm. I know during the thousand years, God explains why they didn't make it. But knowing they didn't make it, it's bad enough and seeing them burned would break my heart. Mm -hmm. That alone would be embedded in my mind to see one of my children or close family members on fire. Mm -hmm. yeah, wow. that's, that's a really, uh, really tough question. And it's true. Um, it is really true. God does not want to see our family burning any more than we do. You know, God did not want to see the antediluvians drowned and God definitely didn't want to see Sodom and Gomorrah burning. Um, God's heart will be broken along with our hearts at his work of judgment. This work of judgment is I, described in Isaiah chapter 28 as his strange work or his strange act. Mm -hmm. That's Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 21. So, God really never wanted anyone to be consumed by the fires of his justice. You know, the Bible tells us in Hebrews 12, 28, that God is a consuming fire to sin wherever found. And so God is pleading with us and through us, pleading with the world, with every son and daughter of Adam, please, please, why will you die, says the yeah. Lord of hosts. That's God right. longs for us to respond. And you can imagine Noah preaching for 120 years. He didn't want anyone to, to drown, you know, in the floods that hit the antediluvian world. And so he pled with them and really, it should motivate us. We should be motivated to reveal more and more of the goodness of God. You know, we have times where we want to take vengeance into our hands, you know, and right. God says, I will repay. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink, because by doing that, you heap coals of fire on his head. Well, the coals of fire, first and foremost, are conviction. God wants to convict people, and he does that as we refuse to return evil for good. But then there's this section in Romans chapter 2 that talks about God's goodness that leads to repentance. And if we resist that, re that goodness that leads us to repentance, we treasure up to ourselves wrath against the day of God and the righteous revelation mm -hmm. of his just justice. And that wrath 
that is treasured up is what is described in Romans chapter 6, verse 23 as mm. the wages of sin. Mm. And so God is a God of justice. You know, I think about stories that I hear. I heard one just today about um, a sister who was brutally beaten, oh. you know, by, uh, by these thugs, these, these uh, drug dealers and left for dead basically. And she never pursued any justice for herself because they threatened that they would come back and take her life and mm. everything that was dear to her. And so that is going to be a judgment, a justice call on God's behalf, in her behalf. Mm. Uh, and God is going to bring to account and to justice everyone that has done wickedly. So our uh, plea is that we would uh, encourage people, our children and others, um, to take seriously the words of God. Mm -hmm. And to recognize also Revelation chapter 21, where it says there's going to be a day when there's a new heaven and a new earth, and there's gonna be mm -hmm. no more pain and no more crying and no more tears and no more suffering. You know, time is a great healer. And indeed, we may lose a loved one, and we're just going to have to empathize with God in that experience. But in a trillion years, at a billion years, a trillion years, a Googleplex of years, <laughs> the time is going to go by, and we're going to grow up like calves in the stall, and we're going to be healed, and God is going to wipe away all tears from our eyes. Amen. Amen. Thank you wow. so much for that hope-filled answer. Nice. Praise the Lord. Pastor Ryan, we're coming back to you. You know what I love about the questions? They run the whole gamut. <laughs> some of them are heavy, some mm -hmm. of them, but the, all of them are authentic and from honest right. seekers of truth. Mm -hmm. This one's about Easter. Marie and Papua New Guinea, should Christians celebrate Easter? <laughs> well, I appreciate this question, uh, Marie. Thank you so much for, for asking it because it gives me an opportunity to tell the world uh, that, you know what, there's nothing wrong in recognizing or celebrating the resurrection of Christ, right? Isn't that something to celebrate? Yes. I think that's, I mean, praise God. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I find myself every single year when it comes time to, you know, around the time that people are celebrating or bringing, you know, into their conversation and, and, and into the practices of their, of their faith, you know, the celebration of Christ's resurrection. I find myself pulling out all those songs that are dealing with the risen Savior. Amen. I just, there's nothing wrong with that. We should declare because none of us, myself, you included, everyone here, none of us would be sitting here had he not resurrected. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing wrong with celebrating mm -hmm. the, the risen Lord because we should. Mm -hmm. um, however, uh, when we talk about Easter in the worldly pagan sense, we have to do a little bit of, take some self, you know, some, some spiritual inventory, do a little mm -hmm. bit of research and determine that when we go a little deeper into the into history and we determine the origins of, of Easter, uh, what we call Easter, of course it comes from the name of a Babylonian goddess, goddess of fertility. Get this, her name was Ishtar. Mm. Ishtar, mm -hmm. Ishtar, Easter. Okay, this is where we get the name, the, the concept of the name of Easter. It comes from the the, the worshiping of the Babylonian goddess of fertility, mm -hmm. Ishtar, and and oftentimes some of the symbols that was associated with the worship of this reproductive goddess, of course, was the prolific little reproductive rodents, rats. You know, or, or not rats, bunnies. But, uh, bunnies. There They're you all go. Over our Bunny rabbit. Well, you might as well call them rat, right? <laughs> I'm just like, no, no. Oh, bunnies can be cute. But nonetheless, bunny rabbits, they're prolific little reproducers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and also eggs. These are symbols of reproduction. And these are symbols that go as far back. They have them etched into old ancient symbols. They go as far as back to Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia and Ca the Canaanite goddess, and as well as the Babylonian goddess, goddess of fertility. So a lot of these pagan practices, of course, come into the church mm -hmm. around the 4th century AD when the church and, and pagans are, you know, Constantine united the church into under his pagan rulership and of course over time you know some of these rites and ceremonies that you know Paul or Peter and all these mm -hmm. guys never so, you know none of them actually ever practiced they crept silently into the church and mm -hmm. then uh, you know over time and so in this case we there's nothing wrong with celebrating but we do have biblically speaking Romans chapter 6 verses 3 through 10 tells us that God has given us the symbol of baptism mm -hmm. as a, as a, a, a symbol of, of of something that represents or reminds us of of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Just to read the first few verses here, it says, Or do you not know that as many as us, as us were baptized into Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore, yes. we were buried with Him through baptism into His death, and that just as Christ was, again, raised from the dead by the glory of our Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So, mm -hmm. baptism is a symbol yes. of the resurrection of Christ. Nothing wrong with celebrating His resurrection. Just don't get caught up in the pagan practices. Mm -hmm. Leave that to the world. Mm -hmm. We should be separate from the world. World. Amen, Amen, Ryan. Thank you. That has good balance of that mm -hmm. answer. I like it very much. Sister Shelley, this is, I don't know who it's from. It doesn't say. My question is, how long did Adam and Eve stay in the Garden of Eden? You know, the Bible re uh, records 4,100 years of history. 
and approximately 2,300, over half of that time, is recorded in Genesis. When we look at Genesis chapter 1 to 11, there is 2,000 years of world history mm. distilled down into those first 11 chapters. It covers the creation of the perfect world, the creation of a perfect man and woman, the fall into sin, the flood, and then the dispersion of the nations. And the rest of Genesis is on the patriarchs. Mm. So here's the point. Genesis chapter 1 through chapter 3 is the prologue mm. of the rest of Moses' writings. I love the first creation account. He's talking about the transcendence of God. We see God outside of our physical realm, and mm. we realize God's a whole lot bigger <laughs> mm. than the universe. But then he comes back and he recaps a second creation account in chapter 2. And now we see the eminence of God, mm -hmm. that He is an up close and personal God mm -hmm. who created, who breathed mm -hmm. into them. Mm -hmm. And the bottom line is, we don't know how long Adam and Eve yeah. were in the garden, but it was long enough they walked with God. He taught them. He taught them how, what His expectations were. He taught them all kinds of things and how to actually think about his plan for humanity and, mm -hmm. and how to be good stewards. Mm -hmm. And here's the most important part of their history. That's Genesis 3.15. After mm. they declared their independence from God, mm. they sinned and ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Genesis 3.15 is the mm -hmm. first announcement we have of the Messiah who would be of the seed of the woman. Mm -hmm. And that Messiah was going to crush the serpent's head. So we see that God set into motion the sacrificial system. He made skins for their covering. And you know what? I believe that Adam and Eve from Genesis 3:15 and the sacrifices, they fully understood mm -hmm. the coming Messiah. Right. And, and we can see some evidence of that mm -hmm. in scripture. But the point is, when they were banned from the garden so that they wouldn't pluck from the tree of life and eat and live as sinners forever, they had this hope in their heart mm -hmm. that they were going to be redeemed. Amen. And that's, mm -hmm. that's the beauty mm -hmm. of God's yeah. word. He may execute justice or judgment, but he always executes mercy. Amen. 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 Beautiful. Don't you love our God? Amen. Yes. Yeah. What a privilege it's been to hear each one of your answers to these Bible questions. And there's a bonus question because we have time for a bonus question. I'm putting you all on the spot. <laughs> this is a question for everyone and I hope you're all going to answer. Sure. I know we get requests a lot from people and this is just Jill speaking. I'm being honest here. I believe that you all are some of my favorite Bible teachers. I love to mm -hmm. hear you share the Word of God. So people ask, how do you study? And what mm -hmm. tools do you use to study? Do you use the Strong's Concordance? Or do you have an app on your phone? Or I want to go around and you each share maybe mm -hmm. something that helps you mm -hmm. in your study of the Word. I don't know who wants to go first. Sure. Don't everybody speak at once. I'll, I'll, I'll start and <laughs> let them clean up if they want. Uh, so, you know, I use m multiple different tools when I study. Um, the number one study tool that I use is obviously the Bible. Amen. You can't, you can't, uh, go, but, but obviously there are a lot of things in the Bible that sometimes we can't find. So I have several Bible softwares that I use. I have a, a digital version of the Strong's Concordance. So yes, Strong's mm -hmm. is Austin awesome Concordance. If you don't mm -hmm. have one, get one. If you don't have the hard copy, then get you, a, you know, if you have an iPad or a computer, there's some uh, versions of, of the software out there of the Strong's Concordance that you can do word searches, phrase searches, that really amplifies and helps to en enhance your Bible study experience. Um, I also have uh, other softwares that I use. One is called Logos uh, that helps me to search a plethora of, oh my goodness, I don't even know if that's the right word to use. Mm. It, it, it's really too big for me. The software is just, an, it's a massive database of all kinds of different commentaries uh, from trusted sources that you can use. Uh, and so there's many different ways that we study. Also, I study by memory 
remembrance, memorizing. When you study something, try to memorize it, say it, write it, read it, say it out loud, preach it, share it. These are ways that you study and it also sticks with you over time. So that's just a quick little juice version of my own. If you guys I like it, share. Well, I, I use a very, very old, it's not even available anymore, but it is a, a Bible software. The way in which I study is a little bit unique, mm. but it's the way my mind works. I will, if I'm going to look up a scripture, say, on salvation, I type in salvation and every scripture mm -hmm. yeah. on salvation, yeah. I print it out. Mm. Then I go and I read them in context. Mm. I, I mean, that's okay. just the way I like that's, to study. That's because, good. Because, the strongs. because it gives you, you know, well. every Bible topic is like uh, a multifaceted diamond. And we have to always remember the law of first mm -hmm. use and you see how it's first introduced and you see how it is then uh, developed mm -hmm. throughout scripture. Mm -hmm. But I love the vines, strongs and the vines. Mm. That's good, yeah. amen. Pastor James. Everything they said. And in addition to this, <laughs> and that is that using the concordance and getting the study together, I'll sometimes be thinking. So this morning I was thinking about one of the questions that um, was on my brain and some thoughts just came into my brain and I thought, you know, God, sometimes when we study and sometimes when we pray, but then sometimes we meditate. Mm -hmm. And meditation yes. on the Word of God is really important. And I'll just yes. give you an example. Um, if I have a couple of seconds, mm -hmm. maybe I don't. Okay, so no, in, no. in our answer on the second death, a, a final b biblical confirmation um, of Christ's experience is found in, in Matthew 20, 28, where Christ says, fear not them that kill the body, but them that can kill the body and the soul. And Isaiah 53 talks about that. And that was impressed upon my mind this morning as I was just thinking about the question. So mm -hmm. meditation. Amen. Yes. Meditation. Oh, yeah. I love it. Thank you mm -hmm. all for sharing. What we're gonna do now is we want to give one more time the way for you to send in your own Bible question. It might be one of these scholars or someone else, someone from the 3ABN family. We want to hear from you. Your questions are are important, so send them in. If you're enjoying our 3ABN Bible Q&A, then tell your friends. Each Monday, we'll bring you a fresh program answering the Bible questions you send us, using God's Holy Word to shed light on those texts that seem difficult to understand. To have your questions answered on a future program, just email them to us at BibleQA at 3ABN.TV. That's BibleQA at 3ABN.TV. You may also text your questions to 618-228-3975. That's 618-228-3975. Be sure to include your name and where you live, and then watch 3ABN Bible Q&A for answers from God's Word. Amen. We have just a few moments left of this program, 3ABN Today Bible Q&A, where we take and answer your questions from the Word of God. I want to give each one of our family here an opportunity to share a closing thought. We'll start with Pastor James. Yeah, I just want to close again on the second death, Isaiah chapter 53. I love these verses because they really lay out for us the heart of God. You know, He experienced the soul sacrifice for us. Uh, verses 10, 11, 12 say um, that he poured out his soul unto death. But notice verse 11 specifically, it says, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Mm -hmm. And by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. I love that picture. You know, Christ went through a lot for us, but when he sees what is accompl it accomplishes, as in Hebrews chapter 12 again, he's gonna be satisfied. Amen. Yes. You know, I just wanna add something about study because one thing that I just encourage you some of the best learning times are just when I'm in the Bible. I always pray that the Holy Spirit will help me to understand before I open God's Word. And I'm reading and I get to something and I'm like, God, what does that mean? Yes. He doesn't answer right away, but as you go week by week, things start coming mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. Amen. I used to be a championship Easter egg hunter. <laughs> <laughs> and when I was a kid, I did not know until I was a teenager that, that you know, that was about mm. the resurrection of Christ. Teach your kids the Word of God. Mm. Yeah. If you're going to do the whole Easter thing, make sure they understand that it's about Jesus. Don't eclipse Jesus. 
Amen. Praise Amen. Him and lift Him up in your child's mind. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank Love you that. so much, Pastor Ryan, mm -hmm. Shelley, Pastor James. Thank you for being family. Thank you for being part of the Three Band family and for sharing from your heart and from the Word mm -hmm. of God. And we thank you for being part of our family as well. Know that we love you, that we pray for you. We'll see you next Monday.